Hello everybody, Hooded Cooper Commander 788 here. It's time for another G.I. Joe comic book review and we are picking it back up with issue number 29. In the previous issue, G.I. Joe fought a Cobra Robot Army and Cobra Rattlers in the Florida Everglades. Destro's Cobra Rattler attacked the G.I. Joe killer whale, Destro was shot down, and Deep Six was badly wounded. A couple local cops joined the fight, their vehicle was destroyed, they attempted to take shelter in what they thought was an abandoned cabin, but it was Zart Tan's cabin, which Firefly blew up before leaving. Issue 29 has a spectacular cover. Destro fires a machine gun, Roadblock lifts a metal door for cover, and Duke takes aim with a pistol. On the splash page, we have a title, Beached Whale. The creative team is Larry Hama Script, Frank Springer Pencils, and Andy Mushinsky Inks. The G.I. Joe Killer Whale hovercraft is being towed to a fishing dock in Erlinger's Cove, Florida. Deep Six is still badly wounded and sprawling on the deck of the Killer Whale. The Joes are being mocked and ridiculed by bystanders because I guess there's a lot of anti-military sentiment in the American South? That's news to me. The Joes begin repair on the killer whale. Roadblock removes a section of armor plate. Some locals decide to play a prank on Roadblock by holding on to some handles on the armor piece, handles that were not present in earlier panels. But Roadblock is able to lift the armor plate with the three guys on it. Roadblock is superhuman. Back in the Everglades, Firefly and Destro talk about their plans to get even with Cobra Commander for abandoning them. Back at the secret Cobra base in the town of Springfield, Cobra Commander has returned to cheering crowds. There is one person in the crowd who is not cheering. It is a boy with dark hair. We will learn that this is Billy, Cobra Commander's son. We don't know that yet, though. This character was first introduced in issue number 10, and we won't learn about his parentage until later. Oh, spoiler, this is Cobra Commander's son. Sorry if you hadn't read the 35-year-old comic book yet. Deep Six gets airlifted on the G.I. Joe Dragonfly helicopter to the USS Jane, the freighter that serves as G.I. Joe's sea base. Get a panel with a doctor who is not Doc, and another Joe who is maybe rock and roll, with another guy who is maybe clutch? These are all off model, so your guess is as good as mine. Back at Erlinger's Cove, the Joes are working through the night to repair the killer whale. Roadblock and Duke are using bicycle tube repair kits to repair the flotation skirt, and wait a minute! Roadblock is standing in the water to repair the skirt, and the water doesn't even go up to his knees. Must be low tide, I guess. Back in the Everglades, Destro and Firefly have captured an alligator poacher, and they are threatening him to get information on how to get a bigger boat to make it back to Springfield. Meanwhile, in Springfield, Cobra Commander is holding a huge rally with tons of Cobra banners and uniformed Cobra troops. He's giving a speech here which both reveals and obfuscates Cobra's political ideology. Cobra seems to be simultaneously both far left-wing and far right-wing. Regarding Cobra's ideology, I think the writer, Larry Hama, was less interested in defining a coherent ideology than warning against the extremes. Here we get the first introduction of the Crimson Guard, a Cobra Trooper in a red uniform. The Crimson Guard uniform had not been finalized yet, so here we just get a generic red jumpsuit. Under that jumpsuit, the Crimson Guardsman is wearing a pinstriped suit. You see, the Crimson Guard is a deep cover Cobra agent meant to work as a fifth column within the United States. He seemingly has a normal life with a normal family, but he is secretly a Cobra agent. This agent's code name is Smith, a very common name, but in later issues, he is known as Fred. Back at Erlinger's Cove, Destro and Firefly use darkness and silence to sneak up on the Joes on the killer whale. Cutter says he wants a frosty bottle of Yojo Cola. This is probably a euphemism for beer, kind of like the Dreadnoughts consuming grape soda and chocolate covered donuts was probably a euphemism for drugs and alcohol. Destro kicks the poacher into the water, still tied up, but fortunately the water is only two feet deep, so he'll be fine. Destro jumps Cutter, Cutter punches Destro in the face, Destro reminds Reminds Cutter that his face is covered with a steel mask, so you won't do much good punching him in the face. Destro explains all this while pounding Cutter in the face. Firefly mans one of the machine gun turrets on the killer whale and opens fire at the Joes on the dock. Duke and Roadblock take cover behind a section of armor plate, and this is as close as we get to the image on the cover. This is almost what's shown on the cover, but it is Firefly at the machine gun, not Destro. Destro jumps behind the wheel of the killer whale and chucks Cutter off, and wait a minute, that's not the driver's seat of the killer whale. That's 
that's the troop carrying compartment. Anyway, Destro and Firefly zoom away in the killer whale just as the dragonfly is returning. Duke jumps into the dragonfly to pursue the bad guys. Roadblock and Cutter stay behind because Cutter is badly hurt. Cutter decides he don't need no doctor and steals, uh, borrows a fishing boat. In the meantime, remember those two police officers, Chief and RL? Well, they're back. They have made their way through the alligator infested swamp back to the interstate where they think they are going to hitch a ride, but they are pushed back into the murky swamp waters by a very inconsiderate Destro driving the killer whale. Oh, the indignity! Oh, the comic relief! The dragonfly catches up with and engages the killer whale. I engaged the killer whale once. It was beautiful. Cutter and Roadblock return to the USS Jane and Cutter takes command of the ship. The USS Jane deploys its hydrofoils and goes to ludicrous speed on the gas turbine. I assume this idea came from the James Bond movie Thunderball, which had a hydrofoil similar to this. It would have been well known to the author of this comic book in 1984. Chief and RL are walking along the middle of the interstate. The very narrow interstate. Florida has an interstate for bicycles. I bet you didn't know that. The Jane, with her hydrofoils straddling the interstate, flies right over the two guys. Oh, the indignity. Oh, the comic relief. Oh, I said that already. Yes, it is possible to have a T-shaped hydrofoil, which you could theoretically straddle a roadway with as long as there was water on each side, but how did the hydrofoils straddle the road in the first place? Cutter pushes the USS Jane over land, or shallow water, I guess, which causes the hydrofoils to break away. Tripwire warns that they are now grinding away hull plates. Cutter says, don't bother me with details. Never tell me the odds. Cutter successfully maneuvers the freighter across land and into the gulf. I'm not 100% sure this is possible. In fact, I'm 110% sure this is not possible. Firefly and Destro are in a heap of trouble, their machine guns are jammed, and they are under attack by both sea and air. Duke gives Destro the chance to surrender, and Destro gives his answer in the form of wrist rocket. Sprang! The Dragonfly's engine is damaged and the helicopter is about to crash, so Wild Bill steers the helicopter into the front of the freighter, hoping the cushion of air will give him enough lift to land on the deck. Duke is a little nervous. He and Wild Bill have this exchange where Wild Bill is like, hey, what's the matter? You don't think I can do it? And Duke is like, nah, I'm just a little nervous because I'm in a flaming helicopter over the ocean. Just do it already. The Dragonfly crash lands on the deck of the Jane, and Duke and Wild Bill barely make it out alive. Tripwire says, Cutter's been acting weird ever since he came back aboard. I don't know why. It's like he doesn't like me. All I did was question every action he took. Two depth charges launch from the killer whale, one on each side, and yeah, that's not how the toy works. It has depth charges on one side, but we might as well overlook that. We've already overlooked so much else. The Jane opens its sea doors and swallows the whale. It's like a reverse Jonah. Upon inspection of the killer whale, it appears abandoned, and the cabin is filled with plastic explosives. Although it doesn't look like plastic explosives, it looks like liquid, but what do I know? Tripwire finds a detonating device and... Urk! There's only seven seconds left on a timer! There's not enough time to get it up to the deck, there's only time to talk about it. Tripwire dives on the explosive Steve Rogers style in a heroic moment of self-sacrifice. Get back! Roadblock says, get off that thing, will ya? Roadblock throws it through a ventilation duct, which leads to a funnel on the main deck where the bomb explodes harmlessly. The Joes figure out that Destro and Firefly must have been in the depth charges. They were bobbing right past us like two cans of cream of cobra soup. Roadblock chides Tripwire for his attempt at self-sacrifice. He's like, hey, don't be so eager to die for your country, man. The government paid a lot of money to train you, and you do care about the public fisc, don't you? The Joes want to turn around and find those two depth charges, but it's impossible. The fishing fleet is out, and there is no room to maneuver. Lurking in the shadows of a stolen fishing boat, Destro and Firefly plan their return to Springfield. Next issue, the Dreadnoughts on a Rampage. Yes, that's what I'm here for. From a technical standpoint, this is not a good issue. I'm not a fan of Frank Springer's artwork. His art always seems a bit sketchy and unfinished. The characters are always a bit off-model, which is not a big problem in itself, but like on page 10, Roadblock has straps on his uniform uniform that appear and disappear in multiple panels on the same page. The killer whale does not work that way. I'm pretty sure hydrofoil boats don't work that way. Just nothing works that way. Despite all this, as a young reader when I first got this issue, I loved it. The cover captivated me. That flame burst looks like it was done with an airbrush and it looked really cool. At the time I got this issue, I did not have the killer whale yet, but I knew the killer whale did not work this way. Nonetheless, I loved seeing it in action. And the action is 
great through most of the issue. It keeps the pace up very nicely. The mystery of the Crimson Guard was introduced, and that captivated me. I had to keep reading to find out what happened with that. There were good character moments for Roadblock, which further cemented him as one of my favorite characters. This was not my first G.I. Joe comic book by a long shot, but it refreshed and reinvigorated the series for me. I read this comic so much the cover came off. My childhood copy of issue number 29 looked like this. I feel like I've seen this ad for Fig Newton's 10,000 times. This is why you can't judge art by objective standards. Subjectively, it can be much more than the sum of its parts, and that's what this issue was for me. Do I recommend this issue despite its flaws? Yes, it's a lot of fun. That was my review of G.I. Joe issue number 29. I hope you enjoyed it. I will be doing more G.I. Joe comic book and toy reviews on this channel, so please subscribe so you don't miss them. I also have a huge back catalog of comic book and toy reviews. Please check those out too. Support the channel on Patreon to help me continue doing these videos. I'll be back soon with another one, and until then, remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe.